if you're going to set a standard in your home, you need to be above that standard in most cases, or at least living to that standard. Whenever I come home, no matter if the TV's on, no matter if they're doing homework, it's the kids have to come and I, I got to get, I give them hugs. Children need parents. You don't need your parents to be your friend. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the BR Coalition Podcast. My name is Jordan Berry. I'm here with my dad, Doug Berry, and our good friend, Stephen Barb, today. Uh, today's podcast is all about our families being under attack, being the father and leader of your families, and uh, keeping things simple. So before we get started, Dad, can you lead us in prayer, please? You betcha. Would love to. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners God. now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray, pray for, for us. us. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So just a little bit about you, Steve. Can you just fill us in so people know who you are? Just a uh, father of five. Uh, I used to be a teacher. Now I'm a, a software consultant, and uh, just trying to trying to be a man of God and and. Uh, Live in the image of of Jordan and and uh, Douglas over here. <laughs> oh, whatever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, by the way, we should we should pause at this point. Bring us up. You were teacher of the year. That's you if know, I'm not mistaken. Not gonna. Yeah. You know, if you just want to go ahead, not just one school, but uh, of the whole the whole city. So yeah, yeah. you know, one millions and millions of dollars for that award. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? No, you didn't. No, no, no. You got a little award. That's all it was. They, they, gave, they gave me a trophy <laughs> and, and a free dinner. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. And then we get a free dinner. What, Applebee's or? Whoa, 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 whoa. It was at the local church. It was it was the oh. buffet at the local church. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that works out. That works out. All right. So the, the three main parts of this podcast we're going to talk about is uh, our family's uh, being under attack, kind of go into a little bit of uh, things that we've experienced. Um, being a father, a man of the house will be part two. And part three, we're going to talk about keeping it simple and not overcomplicating things. So, Dad, if you could start us off, just kind of run down some of the things, um, some of the areas you see the family in particular. Hmm. If you can under name attack. them all in this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. The areas our family is being under attack. Sure. Now. Uh, you know, the biggest area in general is there's this push to remove God from the equation, to remove men from being men of God that are actually striving to have a relationship with God. When you see a lot of families out there that are falling apart, that's normally the root cause is God is not the center of the family, the center of their lives, but especially of the husband, the father. He has to be at least trying. Now, we like to make clear with BRC to all the people that either listen to us or follow us in any way. Uh, you can't beat yourself up for your humanity. You're human. You make mistakes. But a lot of guys will oftentimes give up and not continue to move forward uh, in those moments. So one of the big attacks is this diabolical push to get God out of people's lives. That's a big part of it. And then, of course, you've got other areas. You've got stuff in the world where things are coming at us. You've got whether it's... Uh, you know, effeminacy, you know, and effeminacy in general is really taking the easy road and rejecting the more arduous, difficult task. And so, you know, you know, we talk a lot about this and I tried to raise all my sons this way, you know, to to appreciate. And effem effeminacy can actually be adopted and embraced by women in, in the wrong way. We're not talking about femininity. We're talking about this soft approach. It's St. Thomas Aquinas, the Prince of Theologians, that states that when you seek the easier road and avoid the more difficult, challenging, arduous task, which is better to do, the arduous one, um, then, then you're, you're embracing this effeminacy. That's a major attack against the family. Um, and then, of course, you've got all the comforts of the world that start to separate the family. Everybody has you know, their own computer, their own TV, their own you know, mobile phone. You know, kids are going off into their own bedroom, their own little cell, and they're just locking down with their technology. And that's a big part of the attack, too. Uh, and, and there's so much more that just kind of offshoots from these different areas. But you remove God from the equation, you get lazy and soft, and then you start separating out the family and you lose the bond of the timing where people are getting together and they're hanging out, having family time together. You're, it's, it's all recipe for disaster. How about you, Steve? 
What do you see uh, affecting your family? The biggest thing that, uh, so I've got five children, three are, are biological and, and two were, were gifted through marriage. And, um, and the biggest attack in, in a blended family is, is especially the, the loss of identity. If, if my family's not anchored in the identity of Christ, it's like, man, you, you just get swept up into the storm. And especially for my, for my older daughters, it's, you, there's so many challenges of being a young woman. It's like you have, you know, if you're, you're either too, you're too skinny, you're too fat at the same time. And it's like, if you don't have that identity as a child of God, you you start picking up the identities of, of the things of the world. And man, you start going down that hill and it's, it's a hard hill to heart, a hard hill to go against. I think one of the biggest things that I see right now is just men don't really know what their role in the family is anymore. You know, you have, uh, I mean, back in the day, you had men who were the breadwinners and they come home and then they were there to be loving fathers and the the woman traditionally would be the nurturer of the family. But you have so much. I'm not saying that the woman should go out and make money for a family at all. I'm not saying that we have to go back to our roots at some point and figure out what leadership does the man have in the house? Like, where does where does his role? Exactly, because it's like too often it's the the husband and the wife both have to be the husband and the wife at the same time. It's like, let the man be the man and let the woman be the woman. And when you're in your natural roles, you'll find more happiness, more stability, more peace. So let's talk about that. What that looks like, dad, can you comment on that? Cause there's obviously extremes in this area. You have guys who will say, no, I don't change diapers. No, I don't do the dishes. No, I do nothing around the house. I just work, right. you know, and then that can kind of be a little misogynistic at times. And then you have the other side of it where, you know, the woman does all the work and the man is the stay at home dad, you know, that's becoming more and more popular. So do yeah. you, is there a negative, is that, is that, you know, is there negative effects of that? Yeah. I, I mean, I think in, in general, not a, not a blanket statement for any of this, but in general, there are certain roles that t- certain tasks, I should say, that work with the different roles of husband and wife, male and female. The man is more of a natural protector, you know, and as you, you you mentioned about the nurturing, the nurturing has to be part of this. That's predominantly a female trait. You know, this is by God's design. This has been set up this way in general. Someone comes in, you know, the middle of the night, kicks in the door and tries to threaten the family. I mean, a woman can learn how to fight, protect and defend. But there's something about the natural inclination that a man has as a protector to engage the bad guy. There's also a structure that God has set up, spiritual authority. The husband, the father has a spiritual authority that no one else in the family can equal. Does that mean that the wife doesn't have some spiritual authority? No, over the children, she does. And in a, in a very in, in a certain way over the man in the area of his body, and this has been you know discussed. We had podcasts uh, that I do with uh, Father Heilman, the U.S. Grace Force podcast. We've had Father Chad Ripker on the Exorcist talk about this. You know that there is a specific little area of authority that the woman has over the body because of the marital union and their one flesh. But in general, he has an authority over the spirituality of everybody in that home under that roof, who are his his children and his wife, that role cannot be usurped by her. So when we get to this kind of anything goes and anybody's roles can interchange and and shift here and there, that becomes very problematic, especially in the spiritual realm. But even on a natural level, there's something really about a child wanting an approval from the father. It's different than the approval of the mother. It's more the nurturing of the mother, but the approval of the father. And this is something I know you guys are both, you're raising young kids right now, and I raise five. They all moved out of the house. Okay. But that was something my wife and I talked a lot about. Your mom and I, son, went through that a lot about, you know, that there's a certain approval that dad has. But dad lays down a certain degree of authority, too, that the wife doesn't necessarily carry the same weight. I jokingly would say when I would talk around the country about this, you know, Mom can yell out the front door, Jimmy, it's time to come home. Jimmy's down the street playing with his friends. Oh, that's just mom. You know, dad yells out the door, Jimmy. And that voice alone, all the kids are running home. You know, at least there was a time when they did. You know, now it's a little little more rogue with some of the kids these days. Point being, there is a natural role that God has given to each. And when it starts crossing the line too, too easily, it's it, the whole thing can start to collapse. Does that mean the husband can't change the diaper or nurture? No, to a degree, he has to step up at times and be part of that. All right. 
But there are also times when the wife has to step up and lay down a certain type of authority because, you know, it supports the husband's role. So, and that's going to be a little bit different for different couples. So again, no blanket statement on this, but in general, these roles are the way they are. Uh, for the most part, they are. Now, that's going to sound chauvinistic and old-fashioned. Sorry, that's really what it is, though, in general, and has been for centuries. Only in our recent decades have we seen a real breakdown of the, of the family, and in large part because a lot of these roles have been so skewed and so mixed up. You know, and that's, I literally had a 30-minute conversation. Let's be honest. It was me getting lectured by a, a rather opinionated young woman. But she was telling me how I was being chauvinistic because I said, if someone breaks into my house, my wife is getting the kids and taking them into the closet and protecting themselves, and I'm going to go clear the house. She's like, oh, no. Oh, no. You fight. You and your wife fight together. I was like, somebody's going to get hurt. I don't know who it is, but somebody's going to get hurt. If if me and my wife are both running to a bad guy, who's going to take care of the kids? It's just this, this mentality of equality. It's like, No. Everything doesn't have to be equal all the time. It's like, look, I go sweep the house. My kids, go, my kids, and my wife go protect themselves. This, when you try to make everything equal, somebody gets hurt, and and families and the relationships are getting hurt because everybody's trying to be equal. the The father's trying to be the equal cook and and provider. And it's like, look, I can't work forty hours a week and cook forty hours a week. I just I'm not Pajay Pio. I can't buy locate. <laughs> I used to buy locate, but I would always get I'd always get beside myself and have to stop doing it. So thank you very much. But you know, on that point, let me throw this in there too, too, Steve, is is you know, there is again that natural inclination, but there's that natural ability that the man has to be more aggressive and physically stronger in most all cases. Doesn't mean my wife doesn't know how to fight. I mean, your wife does, I know your wife does. You teach him the basics, but in general. I'm still much bigger than my wife. I'm much stronger than my wife. And I'm the better one to engage over and above my wife's situation. I have, you know, as a man, you have that something that's uh, in you. I don't have the gentleness and tenderness that my wife has. I mean, as my son growing up, it was pretty obvious, okay? My wife would be like, oh, you hurt yourself. Oh, let me help you. I'd be like, ah, you know, rub some dirt in it, throw some duct tape on it, and get back out there. You know, we got more to do. All right, but when you're a kid, when you're scared, you call for dad. Yeah. And when you're hurt, you call for mom. That's it's it. It's just, yeah. I think in general, we need to understand that God make, creates us all equal, the same in dignity. Correct. As yeah. children of God. Uh, you know, child of God, daughter of God, son of God. That's we're, we're all children of God. That dignity is equal, but there's it's too many examples you could give that he does not give the gifts and the talents, the size, the shapes equal to everybody. So let's talk a little bit about uh, going into part two here. Let's talk about how we become leaders that our families want to follow. So God has given us this role in the family to be a leader, which is as much of a, you know, it's a huge responsibility. Huge responsibility. So how do we become men that our families look up to, aspire to be, want to follow? Basically starting with ourselves. Well, the first thing you got to do is you have to be your kid's friend and you have to buy them all the stuff they want. Because when they're happy, they get all the candy they get, they get to dictate their schedule. This is a completely different dad than I yeah. grew up with. I don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not how I raised you? No. no you, you have to realize, your, again, you realize your role. I would tell you guys, I'm your father. I'm not your friend. But I love you and will fight for you harder than your friend ever would. I'll go, I would tell you, I'll, I'll go through a wall for you. That was one of my friends. You used the term I, ally a lot growing up. That's it. You weren't our friend. You were our ally. That's it. We were on the same battlefield together, but... And that's the thing is, you know, I was talking to some guys about this and they were saying, you got to be, you got to be their friend. You got to be their friend. I'm like, my kids are going to have plenty of friends. Right. They need a father. Yeah. We need our father in heaven, right? They need their earthly father. Yeah. I think the, the word ally is, is a great word because it says I'm aligned with you. I'm on the same battlefield with you. And that's what I would tell you. I remember, you know, when, when one or, or all of you at one point or another would say, Hey, Dak, and I talked to you about something serious and, you know, we would talk about certain things. And I, 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 yeah, I wanted to make that clear. As an ally, it's more than just a friend, though. But you bring the father or you ladies, the mother role into that. And you say, I'm your ally, but I'm your mother or your father. And that 
that takes you to another level because that's ordained by God. That really makes this something unique and very special. And you're right. Children need parents. You don't need your parents to be your friends. It's a ridiculous approach. It never, ever. You can be friendly. We had a lot of movie nights. We had a lot of ice cream. Hey, right. we did that. But when we would shift the gears because, you know, I've got to be dad, you know, got to flip the switch and boom, it's time to be dad. And that just meant, okay, there has to be a certain structure. There has to be a certain order of things. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's the key part right there is you've got to understand the role and be faithful to the role as, as father or you ladies as mother in order for there to be structure in the family. When I was a teacher, this is like the number one thing that, especially as, as young teachers, it's in the, in the beginning of the school year, you would always have the nice, the friendly, the friendly teacher. But man, every, every teacher who started out as the friendly teacher eventually burned out because you're trying, you're trying to play too many different roles. But the, the teacher who was firm and consistent and was always their ally, you know, it was like an anchor in the ocean where the storms come, but the kids, kids know what they're going to get. And that's where parents have to be, have to be the ally. The parents have to be the ally because it's like, if you're their friend, one day you're going to have to tell them something that they're not going to like to hear. And they're like, why aren't you being my friend? Why? Because I'm, I need the best from you. I don't need to just be your pal and high five you. I need you to be the best man or best woman that you're going to be. Which is really funny because when you think about it, other areas in life, whether it's your boss, your coach, and even parents love it when the coach of their kids football team or baseball team, whatever sports team they're on. They love it when the coach has that, that, you know, respectful understanding that these are human beings that I'm coaching, but I'm going to expect the best out of them. I'm raising the bar. And if I got to get firm with them once in a while, I get firm with them and parents are like, yeah, teach my kid how to play the game. And if that means you got to discipline them the right way appropriately, then do it. That is something everybody understands. You don't want the head of a company to be a pushover and just be friends with the employees. They have to hold the employees' feet to the fire sometimes, have to hold them to task in order to accomplish what needs to be done for the business to run successfully. Same with a team, same with a government. Boy, that's a that's a tough one right there. But in general, you're right. You, you can't be the friend. I mean, you, you can have friendly moments, cordial moments, fun moments together. Yeah. But boy, you got to be the role of the father and the mother. I mean, when when uh, the mud starts to slide, everybody reaches for the stick, right? Mm. The immovable. So we're always looking for structure in our lives. We're looking for some sort of guidance, whether we Google things or get on YouTube or, I mean, look to our peers, you name it. And God has made the family so that there is a role that is always there to guide, to instruct. Yeah. And I think that uh, brings up another point here is, the importance for fathers to be emotionally strong, to be okay with things not always going perfectly, to not get their feelings hurt when they don't get the reactions that they want, or being okay with playing the long game and, and not necessarily expecting someone in your family to change right away, especially when you're raising children. So um, can we talk a little bit about the importance of being a physical leader and then also the spiritual leader? Because a lot of guys have either, again, there's extremes. You have the one who will work his you know, tail off to make the money, put the bread on the table. But then when it comes to spiritual, oh, no, that's the woman's job. I don't, prayer, that's not my thing, you know. But then there's the other side where, oh, no, great spiritual leader. But then he doesn't, he lacks the grit to get in there and show his kids, teach them how to fight, right? Raising, raise warriors. So uh, do you have anything to say about the, the balance or the integration of prayer and action. Well, you, you pretty much summed the whole thing up right there. I think we're done. I mean, how, how do you add to that? That was, that was really good. No, you're right about all of that. That is absolutely true. I've heard women actually say this to me, you know, in their 20s to 30 year old, you know, over the years, every now and then at a talk somewhere, they come up, uh, Mr. Barry, look, we got a problem with a lot of the men in the world. What's that? Well, you know, I can't find a guy who just kind of embodies really what you just said, son, both of these pieces, you know, either he's really faithful and he goes to Bible study, but oh, I, one lady said to me, I feel like if, if a bad guy broke into the room, he'd hide behind me. You know, or you got the guys that are out there, you know, they can swing the axe and cut down the tree and they can work hard and they can storm a beach and take on, you know, an enemy, but they have no faith, no gentleness, no, no prayerfulness to them. 
We want a combination of both. That's what a lot of young ladies are really seeking. And the, the term, gent the word gentleman, gentle man. There's a gentle side, but there's a man. And what is the definition of man? And that therein lies some of this problem is the world has redefined man, redefined woman, of course, with all the gender fluid. Ah, it's just gotten completely off the off the rails now. But in general, if we're talking about a man who knows how to be, and I think a lot of guys don't know how to have that gentle side, that kind side, and still be able to, as I like to say, flip the switch if they have to, and all of a sudden they've got to engage in some way. They've got to they got to roll up their sleeves. They got to go work a 15 hour day in the hot sun. They got to go dig a ditch, or they got to they got they got to go in the middle of the rainstorm and change a flat tire. Do what is required. Do what's required. Yeah. And not have a problem with it, mm -hmm. not complain about it, not get carried away, you know, with uh, with the woe is me sort of attitude, you know. Let's be honest. When uh, my brother, my brother complimented, he gave he gave the Barry clan a, a compliment because he said he said after I was hanging out with the ends for a year or two, he said, Steve, there's something different about you. And it's like when men are around other men and they're they're calling each other to virtue, it's like that's how you. That's how you build that fortitude because it's because it's really anybody can play. Go to any any grocery line, any any traffic jam, any anywhere, people can complain. It's it's the low hanging fruit. But it's the people who who suck it up and, and go to work. And it's like in my mind, my life kind of changed whenever I, I started hanging out with with Dor Jordan and Doug. Because it's like there's no longer any excuses. It's just get it done. It's like, yep, it's tough. It's it's painful, but the only easy day was yesterday. And so just go to work. Stop making excuses. Well, I remember you would ask me that sometimes because, you know, you've been coming over and working out once a week with me um, for a long time. What, two and a half years, two years, whatever it's been now. Um, and I know you would, you know, I would kind of get on your back once in a while about getting your workouts in throughout the week, you know. And, and you know, one day a week is good, but you got to get more in there, you know. And and I tell you, I'm doing four or five, six workouts a week usually. And you would say, yeah, I get so busy. I just, I don't know how, how do you, I say, well, yeah, I raised five kids and, you know, worked ministry and traveled and I know what it's like and so forth. And, and I would try to encourage you and you would say, well, what do you, how do you, what, how do you do this? How do you get that? And I would simply say to you, it needs to get done. It just needs to get done. And we were talking about the importance of planning too, where if you plan your day before it happens to you, like you don't let the day happen to you. Yeah. You can, you control what you, whatever you have control of, you know, you're very intentional about living that day out. And there's always an excuse not to work out. There's always an excuse not to do what you should do. You and know? too often masculinity is left to just, well, I'll get some masculinity. I know me. I grew up in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's not the beacon of, uh, of, of manliest, man. you know, it's not here. It's not here in Texas where, where every man is a man here in Texas. But uh, in Pennsylvania, like masculinity wasn't wasn't really taught. It was it was cool to wear uh, uh, pink colored shirts and it was cool to to to, you know, drink your your mocha latte from from Starbucks. And, you know, it's like men would be like, oh, I have a mocha. I don't I don't drink coffee, but they would there would literally be 20 minute conversations just about coffee. And it's like, hold on, you can have a 20 minute conversation about coffee. But did you do 20 minutes of push-ups? Did you do 20 minutes of sit-ups? And 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 one of the things that as I started getting older, I was like, whoa, I'm getting I'm getting a little bit out of shape. And it's like, I need to, I need to surround myself with a community of good men. So that way I don't let myself slide because because it's easy to just backslide into into mod modernity. Yeah, on that point, I gotta throw this in there too. We're seeing commercials everywhere out there. Uh, I don't want to get too far off track, uh, son of what the notes are here, but Many commercials of low T, low testosterone. And it's all the guys in their 40s on up roughly. Okay, so you're getting there, Steve. You're getting close to that, right? Oh, my friends. I have friends who, who are taking low T. Like, it's not just advertisement. There are close and, friends of mine who are And you're in your mid-30s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, why do you need testosterone? Yeah. And a lot of it is because they, they you know, you, if you slack off, 
of physical exercise of some sort or hard work in general, okay? You know, Father Chad Ripper would say, you got to go out and chop down a tree. You got to dig a ditch. You got to lift some weights. You got to do something physical because- Just move. You got to move. Move your body. And there has to be some <laughs> resistance in that. You know, we got, a, we got a tractor tire in the backyard here. And, you know, we've all flipped the tractor tire. We had it back in Nebraska too. It was- we had a couple of them in our backyard there too. It's just a get down there, get in the dirt, pick it up, flip that thing. Things like that. Some people think that's extreme and that's kind of crazy, but you look at a good number of men, they hit their middle ages, they start getting out of shape, they start getting the low T problem. If it wasn't a problem, you wouldn't see million dollar commercials out there with guys like Frank Thomas and Doug Flutie, you know, ex baseball and football players. You wouldn't see that out there if this wasn't a money-making business because the problem is so serious. It doesn't have to be with nutrition and exercise, a good prayer life, a good balance, like you were saying earlier, son, about the need to incorporate and integrate the two, that I'm a man of, I try to be a man of God, of prayer and faith, but I also want to be a man that could go out there and lift weights or work hard, work on an engine or, or, or just take care of my lawn, even. A lot of things that can actually raise your testosterone, let alone raise your understanding of what, what manhood is. And we've talked about, just just recently we were discussing how we don't necessarily care for the word balance when it comes to things like prayer or yeah. work or yeah. working out or father. You know, you got people say they got the dad hat, then they got the work hat, then they got the, uh, you know, the the football, flag football hat or softball hat, whatever the, whatever the heck they're doing this week, you know. You should be the same man day in and day out. Yes. The same good, prayerful, holy leader of a man and all of that stuff needs to be integrated entirely so it just becomes who you are yeah yeah start, start with yourself be a man of prayer a man of action some ideas i mean we cover we covered working out eating healthy uh reading books shutting the screens off and just going back to reading some books read mm -hmm. scripture open the bible yeah read god's word learn self-defense let's talk about that a little bit yeah the importance of of knowing how to fight yeah, that, that's a big one, and I'll preface it by one of my favorite quotes out there from a movie where John Wayne played Genghis Khan. I think it's called The Conqueror. I don't even remember the movie very well. I saw maybe part of it years ago. It's a terrible casting decision, if you ask me, John Wayne playing Genghis Khan. They believe it's actually the movie when they shot the movie in New Mexico. They believe it was the movie that possibly exposed John Wayne to radiation nuclear fallout because it was an area where they're doing atomic bomb testing and like 90 people on this movie um either the the cast or the crew came down with some sort of uh, cancer or serious sickness uh and john wayne eventually dies from cancer a little side trivia note there for y'all but the point is he plays genghis khan and in this movie there's a scene where you know he's he's a he's a, a ruler and he's taken on you know all over mongolia villages towns and just wiping them out and just dominating. And at one point, the elders of one village come out. They know they're about to be attacked the next day. And they try to negotiate with Genghis Khan. Come on in, bring your men in. You know, we'll give them some some food. You know, we'll give them wine. We'll, we'll give them some comfort and so forth. And someone in Genghis Khan's entourage says, no, the men will stay out here. They'll sleep on the ground where it's hard, where it's tough. Okay? Because if they go in, they'll get too comfortable. If they get too comfortable, they'll get soft. If they get soft, they'll get weak. And if they get weak, they won't be able to fight. And if they can't fight, they'll die. In our world, if we get too comfortable, we get soft. There's no doubt about it. And we're living in a world now where we have, we actually have sleep number beds, lazy boy recliners, heated seats, heated steering wheels in our car, right? We can adjust our thermostat. I do like the heated seats. You do like <laughs> That's just me, though. <laughs> I think I've used them <laughs> twice, like car yeah. rental cars, and I just I can't make myself use them. I gotta yeah. shut them off. I feel like I'm getting soft, and I'm not saying that they don't have their place because you get certain you know, arthritic situations or other health issues. Any of these things can help. I'm not knocking that, but when we turn to comfort as the end all be all, and we don't keep the edge, you remember our buddy Chuck, my friend, my good friend Chuckbo, mm -hmm. and the time that that he was um, staying at the house. He came over to visit us back in Nebraska. Yeah, it was in between, right before he, he was going to go back. To, there was another deployment, right? He was about to go back to the Middle East. Yeah. yeah. And he was in 32 years. He's out of the military now. He was um, he was uh, 
um, EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. He was a master chief, and I just I have a lot of respect. Uh, good Catholic guy, and good, just really good friend. And if he ever sees this podcast, shout out to Chuck Bo. And so there was uh, a couple things. One is he and I were big into his ice cream. We weren't big into you know, hey, let's get a six pack. You know, it was like, hey, let's get a let's get a couple gallons of mint chocolate chip ice cream. You know, it was our thing, and we we're younger in high school. So. Um, he came over, he was on, he was on leave for a while. And I said, let's break out the ice cream. And he said, no, I can't. Cause I'm going back in a couple of days and I got to keep the edge. I got to keep the edge. He wanted to be sharp when he got back there. But I remember I wasn't in the room at this point and you were there with him and there was a strange noise outside. And we lived out in the country and right away. Yeah. So we were on his laptop. He was showing us some pictures he had taken while he was on patrol in his Humvee yeah. and he was showing us some footage and stuff. Uh, and you would walked out of the room. Yeah. We were at the kitchen table. It was probably, it was dusk. So the sun had just hit the horizon. It was starting to get pretty dark outside. And uh, we hear a string, the window to our right was just cracked open. It was a beautiful summer evening. And hear a weird noise outside. It sounded pretty close. And he just slowly raises his head, looks out the window. Without looking away from the window, he says, hey, Jordan, shut the light off. So I just <laughs> reach over, <laughs> shut the light off. We sit there in silence for maybe 30 seconds. He's like, okay, you're good. Turn the light back on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but it, the, the calm, cool, collected nature of yeah. that, and just there was an edge there. Mm -hmm. Just in that little moment, I know it's not that big of a deal, but there was something, at least I could sense, you know, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was like, oh, man, things are about to go down. <laughs> yeah. But it gives you insight into the way a, a guy like that just operates in general. The calmness, right. he's trained. He's been in combat situations. And just the example of the ice cream that you gave, I think that's a great point here, is that we have to know ourselves as men and know our weaknesses, yeah. whether that's fighting temptation, not putting ourselves in, in places that right. we know. I think we've mentioned this in, in the last previous podcast, you know. Why would something be different today if it's been the same for the past five years, mm. if we've done nothing to change the situation, right. you know? No, I'm stronger today. Are you? What did you do to get stronger? What did stronger you do today? between now? Besides, between then besides and now. what you just told yourself, yeah. you know, are you taking the, are you doing the required actions to actually make yourself stronger? Uh, but knowing your weaknesses is the first step to becoming stronger and yeah. keeping that edge. Yeah. You know, knowing what actually does make you soft, what's going to make you not be able to fight, which ultimately could kill us. Yeah, right, right. And that's where. So our <laughs> our oldest daughter's like my wife was kind of she grew up in the mentality of of you know. You gotta you gotta be nice to them because if if you're not nice to them they're they're gonna rebel and it's like no 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 if you if you don't create structure and discipline they they are going to rebel and um and, and you're not saying that it's not a, it's not about don't be nice yeah yeah you're yeah. saying that can't be the priority the yeah. priority has to be the structure and your role to set the structure and show that strength is that what you're saying oh absolutely because like yeah let's be honest like, Re real quick on that the word nice means passive and naive. Oh, that's what so nice. I think a better <laughs> word is kind. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. men, we're supposed to be kind to our families, kind to our children. But, you know, you don't want to be the nice guy. I'm trying. I'm. My wife and I are very careful about that word because it rubbed us the wrong way when we heard that. I'm like, oh, we don't want to be passive or naive, yeah. especially as a man. You don't want to be a nice guy. Yeah. You want to be a kind gentleman, right? So anyway, I just, oh, I just had to throw that in yeah, there real quick because it, it shocked me. I don't know if that helped anybody listening, but it, it kind of shocked yeah. me when i was like oh i don't want to be a nice guy yeah you know? yeah and, and one of the one of the expectations we we made a, a firm expectations with with our daughters it's like look the expectation is not not are you going to go to college the expectation is which college are you going to go to the ex the expectation is not are, are you passing your classes it's it's are you getting a's and uh and that that shift of mentality that making it a little bit harder we're not just going to go oh good job for showing up to school good job for putting your pants on it's like no you you have a job. Your job is to go do good in school and make yourself the best person that you can be. So that way you can later on provide for the family, provide for your future family. And we made it a little bit hard. And, and there was so many back and forth. Oh, you're being too hard. You're being too, we got to be patient. We got to trust the process. Trust the process. And oh, I don't know. Are we doing the right thing? Are we doing? Be patient. Be patient. And my daughters both graduated with uh with associates degrees because they went they did the dual college and it's like they went from elementary middle school kind of struggling at school we made it a little bit harder for them and by raising the temperature a little bit it created more fruits and it's like when you make it a little bit harder 
people will elevate to the to the level that they're called to. When you make it easy, they just sink down to to the lowest common denominator. And it's like making it harder creates greater fruit. Yeah. Well, and that goes along the line with the quote that I, you know, when I when I we started discussing this particular topic is if you get too comfortable, you get soft, get soft, get weak, get weak, can't fight, can't fight, die. Dying doesn't mean necessarily just in the physical. It can be you. You die to your to to your your hopes. You you can die to to just a certain um, appreciation for the good things in life. You, you can die to your talents and not really excel. There's a lot of different ways you can die emotionally, psychologically. Your relationships can die if you become so comfortable that you never really take the time to to be disciplined and work on them. I mean, that's how marriages fizzle out all the time. Oh yeah, it is. You don't take time to continue. Continue to date your your spouse, right. mm. but I think in the original you would ask the yeah yeah keep dating them you know take them out you know make sure you're you're still trying to get that, that you know um, show the, the winning of the heart so to speak. Now you were asking about uh, the self defense part about training them how to actually fight right right the mention of that right. idea the, the the importance of uh, actually physically knowing how to protect and defend yourself, yeah. but in this case what we're going to talk about is protecting and defending your family. I cannot for the life of me understand why, and I haven't been able to for a long time. And I know it's probably cost me, you know, in some areas uh, as a Catholic speaker, and I say that because I've spoken in Catholic churches and conferences for 33 years all over the country and outside the country. And I know there are people who have disagreed with this topic so much that I'm pretty sure it's cost me bookings at times and places because they just don't like to hear this. But as a Christian man, I don't care what your denomination is, you want to imitate, for example, St. Joseph, put a good roof over the head, provide a good living, make sure your family is warm and comfortable to the best of their ability, reasonably saying, right? You know, not excessively, but make sure that they've got what they need taken care of. That's all true. Why in the world would any man leave out the responsibility to be able to protect and defend against a physical threat? If my responsibility is to make sure that my wife and kids can get to a doctor in a hospital if they're sick or hurt or wounded or injured, and I have to make sure that the roof isn't just pouring in rain, that it's a good roof, electricity, running water, food in the, in the refrigerator because I'm working hard to provide a living for my family. But if someone attacks in some way, I'm just going to pick up the phone and call 911 and have somebody else come and take care of it. And we've been through that. Check out our last podcast on the grave duty. That's a couple of podcasts ago. Two, two ago. Yep. Yeah, two ago. That'd be episode six. Yeah, check that out. We'll maybe put it in the link description mm -hmm. or so. But check it out about the grave duty to, to protect and defend. But it takes time to train and it takes time to learn what to do. You don't have to be Bruce Willis or Chuck Norris to know what to do. You don't have to be an expert in martial arts. You know, it, But you have to have some idea as a man. And you have to have the mindset as a man that if there's a threat against my family, spiritual or natural, I'm the protector, and that's my job. And my job is also to teach my family. I raised all my kids with the basics, at least. And then, like you, Jordan, and others, uh, you, you, some of your siblings have taken it and done your own thing with it. You know, your brother Nate took up Krav Maga, took classes on Krav Maga. You know, you've taken up firearms training on your own and some other things as well. But we started with the basics and, and established that. And that's, so it's not just me protecting my family. It's me teaching my family how to be safe because I can't be around them all the time. They're going to move on. You know, you have to be able to do this to your loved ones. Teach them. This, this gets left out all the time. We just, as men, we need to be committed to learning how to fight. But even, but I mean, I think a good first step would just be, be committed to getting your body strong, work out, yeah. be committed to building a little bit of muscle to, for the purpose of getting stronger. We're not saying be bodybuilders here or the next, you know, CrossFit Games winner. Just get stronger, eat healthy, uh, learn how to fight. And that was that was that was the thing that I that I appreciate hanging out with with both of the Barry family is that man, you know, everybody's like, "Oh yeah, bad guy breaks in the house. I'll I'll bust him. I'll rip his face off." Okay, so you'll protect him from exterior phys physical threats. But I love cupcakes, and I was going I was eating like, you know, the the Walmart package of cupcakes. <laughs> and I mean, I would I'd buy them like one a week, two a week. And uh, and my kids kept coming up to me and they're like, Dad, Dad, can I get a cupcake? Can I get a cupcake? And I was like, oh, hold on, hold on. The bad guy's not coming from the outside. The bad guy's my eating habits. My like my I was teaching my kids to to consume massive amount of sugar. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's if a bad guy came in here was like giving my kids cupcakes to the point where they're getting fat. 
that uh, I'd be like, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll punch you in the head. Well, when I do it, it makes it okay. And and I, I literally started changing my eating habits. And I started like going, okay, hold on. What am I teaching my children by like my eating habits? You know, I, I would just find to go. I had a stressful day at work. Okay, whether you had a stressful day at work or not, do you want your kids to have diabetes by the time they're 12? I didn't know you were into cupcakes like Man. that. <laughs> I think we got a new nickname for <laughs> <laughs> <Cupcake>. <laughs> No, don't worry. We won't do that. We won't do that to you. No, but you're right. It's it, and this is a simple thing. I because I know some of our, our our listeners and some of the people who are, you know, BRC members and supporters and all, you know, it's it's hard to get in the habit of of the training, of the exercise and so forth. Start with the basics. You gotta toughen the mind a little bit. And sometimes that is simply, look, maybe you can't give up sugar. Maybe there, and sugar is very addicting. All right. It really is. You know, like I don't sweeten my coffee with, uh, with sugar. I just don't. I use um, stevia, which is a natural sweetener. It's much, much better than sugar by far. If you can cut back on the sugar, cut back. Micro tasks. Micro tasks. Yes. That's another <laughs> podcast we did a while ago. Go check that out. You don't got to do it all at once. You just got to start with a little bit. Just got to start. Yeah. And if you can start with doing push-ups and start with some some sit-ups or some flutter kicks, and if that's too much, start with your walks around the block, build it up. But a lot of you, a lot of you can go to working out. A lot of you can get the push-ups in and the weightlifting. You don't even have to join a fitness club. You can do a lot of body weight exercises. I would say if you have a body, a floor, and gravity, which we all do, right, you can exercise. There are some things you can do to get in better shape, you know, but like you were saying earlier, Steve, a lot of this is an act of the will. And you were both saying that we choose not to because we like to be comfortable and we don't want to get off that couch. And I will say this and that I'd like your opinion on this because I know you, you, you've you been working out a lot more these last couple of years and all. Um, I, I look at the mental victory that I have to win every day. And there've been many times I've sat on my couch, long day. And like you said, Jordan, you have, do, you do have control over your day if you plan it. And every now and then things just go awry and I still got to get my workout in. And you got to plan for that too. You have to plan for that to happen. You have to plan for things not to go according to plan. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, I can look at both of you and try to be the example to the young guys that I can honestly say I rarely miss the workouts. Perfect segue. Leading by example. You were talking about setting standards in your home. People, and this is all on the part of uh, being leaders, becoming leaders that our family want to follow. Uh, if you're going to set a standard in your home, you need to be above that standard in most cases, Mm. or at least living to that standard. No one's, I mean, no one likes a hypocrite, right? So that, that saying, Oh, dad makes the rules. Dad breaks the rules. Yeah. Like that's cute and all, but it doesn't work. What was, what was the one thing you and I talk about that Chuck, our friend Chuck Bo, I'm about to message Chuck and tell him we've talking about you in the podcast. Chuck, got to get him on here. That'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That'd be awesome. Do you remember that thing he told us? As a, he's a master. He was a master chief, right? So he had a lot of guys under his command. And he told us, I never ask my men to do something mm. that I won't do. Mm-hmm. In other or words, haven't I done. haven't, haven't done, done or, or won't do. do. Lead by example. And that, that stuck with us. So yeah. thanks again, Chuck. You know, that you as a husband, father, you want to show that, look, this is, this is how we do it. And I'm going to show you what that looks like by trying to live that myself. It also means when I make mistakes... You see me in the confessional. You see me go in. You've been in there with me, of course, because that just doesn't work that way. But you've seen me for years. You grew up seeing dad get in line for confession. That's the other part. We lead by the example of showing this is what it looks like when when we go to God. This is what a rosary looks like in dad's hand. This is what it looks like when dad's in the confession line, when dad kneels down to receive Holy Communion or however you receive Holy Communion. This is by example. How can we expect our family to be strong mentally, physically, spiritually? How can we expect them to eat healthy, get off the screens, you know, be good, holy people if we aren't Mm. striving every day to be that? And just, you know, we have to lead by example before before we uh, expect our words to mean anything. Exactly, yeah. That's where with my kids, you know, it's like, you guys need to be reading more books. And and, uh, my oldest daughter kind of called me out. She was like, well, what was the last book you read? And I was like, do 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 do. This isn't about me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about your behavior. And it's I like, read yeah. that book on cupcakes just last week. <laughs> yeah. It was delicious. Uh, and but you're right. You're you're right. It's it's you can't expect more than what you're you're doing. And and I'm telling you, 
your comment on on the micro tasks was was fantastic. It was it was what I needed to hear because literally I uh I was just struggling working out and I was like, look, I'm just gonna do five push ups. And I I did five push ups that day and I did I did a little bit more, but it I didn't see the rewards that day, but I saw the rewards the next day when I went into the gym and, and did a, a in my mind it was it was an okay workout, but it was it was a good workout. And it was like if I didn't if I didn't stack the win the day before, if I didn't take that little micro task, and too often we think that we have to you know read Aquinas and do a hundred pushups and and solve quantum mechanics, but it's like a good father just shows up, just does the micro task, and you do that day after day, you'll start stacking wins and it'll become a habit and you'll you'll win win the day. That's it. You want you want these things to become a habit because then you become so much more unstoppable when the when the going really gets tough. Yeah. Uh, let's take a quick break, Dad. Can you talk about the free download, the ultimate preparedness guide that we're put that we uh, we've got in the description? Yeah, this is something I want everybody to go out and take a look at. It's free. You can click on the link in the description below, or wherever you can find it in the in the summary of this podcast. If you're listening to the audio version, it's a free ultimate preparedness guide, physically and spiritually. What are the best ways to get started? A lot of people know that we need to be doing something. Now we are not the type of preppers if you want to call us that and i would say that's what we are spiritually we should all be preparing for a good holy death but even on a natural level we should have some extra food water some extra shelter some direction where we would go extra location to go to if there's our home is compromised medical and self-defense five key things well we have a free preparedness guide that's going to help with that a lot of people just need to get started and then we want to continue to get this word out to you all and that is the word integrate integrate these things into your day-to-day life so that it's not overwhelming and you're not thinking, I got to go buy boxes of food and and set one big room aside for nothing but gear and equipment, food and water, and just be ready for an apocalypse, run to an underground bunker. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about basic common sense steps. It could be as simple as making sure the batteries in your smoke detectors work, having a fire extinguisher in a couple places of your home, having pepper spray or mace, or if you decide to go the route of learning how to handle firearms, taking the steps to be in better shape, to eat better, to get some extra food, some extra water. When you go to the grocery store, buy four extra cans of soup, a couple extra cans of tuna, set them aside. These are for emergency use only. These are simple things. There's so much more in this free ultimate preparedness guide click the link and get the free download and i guarantee you you will benefit from it and share it with others get this information out to others as well all right perfect uh one more point before we get on to the final part of the podcast uh let's talk about allowing our kids to fail in the right areas not in major relationships not in sinful areas but allowing them to lose a game on their little midget football team or, you know, baseball game, right? Saying no to the participation awards, you know, learning, learning the hard way. What, do you have anything to say to that? Yeah. Every single time we lose at something or fail at something, whether it's someone who starts a business and it doesn't go right and it fails, you can learn enormous things from. In the early years, if a child doesn't understand that, though, and everything is either given to them or, you know, you're doing homework for your kid or you're helping them out so they get good grades or they're having a hard time in school and the teacher says, yeah, your kid's got a little unruly behavior going on there. We should talk about it. Oh, how dare you? You know, my kid is, you know, and as a teacher, you may have run into that once in a while where parents come in and defend like crazy their kids. Their kids never learn to have to even interact with people on a natural social level in a productive way. That doesn't help that kid when that kid becomes an adult further down the road. So it's so critical. It's essential without question that our kids learn as we lay the groundwork for them that they're going to make mistakes. They're going to fail once in a while. But I also think it's important to allow them to have these moments of, of, uh, of yeah, call it failure, call it things didn't work out the way they wanted, the game didn't go the way they wanted. Yeah, maybe you could have stepped in as the parent and done something here or there, but you had to let your kid go through it and make these decisions. But even when they learn that they're human and they're going to make mistakes spiritually as well, and they're going to end up committing sin once in a while, which we try to minimize that. That's what we should all be doing. But when we do, there are people that can get so discouraged in the diabolical nature. Uh, well, the diabolical, I should say, forces out there will play against human nature and try to 
try to cause such despair and discouragement. You'll never get over it. You're too weak. You're a sinner. So you keep falling into this sin. He's not going to forgive you anymore. Why do you even try? And you can hear those voices in your head. But if your child has learned from a young age, you make mistakes, you get back up. Okay, you failed in something, you learn from it, and you keep moving forward. Even if they're little steps, but they're going the right direction, those are steps that are going to move you forward. And the point of this is to to give them the opportunity to uh, develop a mental toughness or an emotional toughness. Because right now we're dealing with so many, I mean, children, young adults, old adults who will post a picture to some social media site and they don't get enough likes and all of a sudden their day's ruined or week's ruined. Yeah. You know, if you're not feeling fulfilled because you're not getting enough likes on a post, then we have some evaluation to do. And that can go not just for likes on a, a social media page, but it can be, you know, if you're not getting validation from your peers, you know, you're relying too much on that. And what's what's the saying? Un, uncoachable children are unemployable adults. And so often, you know, you, you have, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm 37 years old and, and I was like, I work with some people. I was like, you can't, you can't do that. And it's like, well, they, they were never, they were never taught to, to not do that. And, and the problem is my, my favorite story with, uh, with, with my daughter is, uh, she, she didn't want to wear a jacket. She was like, I'm, I'm not cold. I'm not cold. And my wife was like, make her put it on, make her put it on. I was like, nope, nope. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And not wear the jacket. Never, never not wore a jacket after that because she she learned she learned the failure of like oh I probably need a jacket I'm kind of cold and I could it would have been really easy for us to run back home go get the jacket and be like oh there there you go but it's like no she had to learn from the loss now was it painful she's like shivering and, and I'm like her teeth her, her teeth were clattering together her lips were turning blue and I was like oh, maybe we should no no no. And uh, it it wasn't that bad. She she was she was out in the cold for ten minutes, but uh, but she she was appreciative of the lesson that she learned. She's like, oh okay, they're not just trying to control me; they're trying they want to keep me from being cold. And and by doing that, she's able to to not make the mistakes in the future. But we so often we hinder them, we hinder their growth by like not allowing them to fail because we because really we don't want to go through the pain that of seeing our children cold. Yeah, and sometimes it's as parents. Parents can get hung up on not wanting to feel like a failure themselves. And I feel like a failure if my kids are hurting in some way. We have to realize that you cannot keep your child from having to go through some kind of suffering in this world. There's going to be situations that they're going to have to face. God has just kind of pretty much structured it that way. No one escapes it. Our job as parents is to help, and any leader is to help those that God has entrusted to their care to be able to deal with those moments, like you were saying earlier, son, to deal with it so that there's a certain mental toughness there, mental and emotional toughness. It's a scary thing. You were telling me this just last week when you were here working out is, you know, some of the people that you've been entrusted to help in your work situation and kind of oversee and mentor, you're looking at young adults that are in their 20s with zero work ethic and zero ability sometimes to endure at a time of crisis or trial. And if you don't you don't teach them that when they're young, it's going to be so much more problematic for them when they become adults. It's a huge disservice to our kids if we don't let them suffer. Obviously, you don't want them to get physically hurt. Yeah. yeah. Any permanent damage should be avoided at all. Sure. All costs. Yeah, there's an appropriate way to do this, in other words, and not just say, oh, you know what? Yeah, you played with the machete at three years old. Yeah. You get, you know, play you play with the bull, games. you get the horns. <laughs> yeah. Play no, that's, games, that's not what we're prizes, talking about. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right, part three, final part of the podcast. Let's keep it simple. So what are some simple things that we as fathers and men and leaders should do every single day with our family? First thing I would say, and I tried to do this, and son, I I hope I did okay on this. Let your children know every day in some way that they're loved, that you appreciate them, you care about them. It doesn't mean it's always going to be communicated and come across that way. But down the road, when you become an adult, you you start looking back at what your parents did and realize, yeah, they were loving me. And if there's anything you're going to appreciate down the road, It's that your kids could look back and realize, yeah, mom and dad were a little tough on me at times. They raised the bar at times. But because of that, I'm a better person. They showed me every day. I never want my kids to doubt that they're loved. Now, I'll tell you what story. One of your brothers said this. 
we were sitting at mass. He was back in town visiting and he and your mother and I were at church and father was preaching a homily. And in the middle of the homily, father said, you ever remember that moment when the first time you heard your dad say, I'm proud of you, son. Remember that moment? And you're thinking, oh, wow, that's a monumental moment. It's a historic moment. And you just, it just, you, you can live on that for the rest of your life. So we're driving home. And of course, I'm thinking in mass when I hear this, I wonder what my son is thinking when he's hearing father talk about this. We're driving home and and what so son, what'd you think of the homily? And oh, this, this, this. And then he brought it up. He said, Yeah, and when father said that about, you know, the first time you hear your dad say you're proud, he said, I I don't really remember that. Now I'm driving and he's in the back seat. And I'm thinking, what do you mean you don't remember that? And he said, Because I grew up pretty much hearing it and knowing it all the time. Because dad, you you kind of made us all feel like you were, yeah, you were proud of us for the good things that we did. Is that true, son? Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. Praise God. No Amen. hesitation there. Amen. Well, I mean, there's <laughs> one of the things, this is something that came to mind, was when I was, uh, we were playing Little League. Yeah. Versus, uh, you know, back at Sprague Martell. Yeah, in yeah. The, in the cornfields. In the cornfield. It was a nice with, baseball field. It's just a bunch of farm teams. But it's in the cornfield. Man, good <laughs> memories back then. Yeah. Um, But I, I played pitcher a lot, pitcher position. So when I would throw, you know, I'd strike three guys out in a row, first person, because you were assistant coach yeah. first person i look over to see you on the dugout i'm like what does dad's face look like <laughs> and i remember one you were always looking and you'd always give me thumbs up or big high five when i run back to the dugout but there was there's one time i remember you were talking to somebody else and i look over and you hadn't seen it and you just i, I don't hold this against you it was right. just <laughs> just this is just an example as a kid how much i was looking yeah. forward to seeing what my dad thought you and you weren't trying to ignore it at all. You were just talking to somebody. Somebody came up to the dugout and was asking questions. But I look over and you weren't looking. And I remember thinking, "Oh, he missed it. I just struck the guy out." <laughs> you know? so, but, but yes, I agree with that. Yeah. I, it was definitely very much a part of not just. It wasn't weekly. It was a daily thing that we heard from you. Well, and and I appreciate that. I hope and pray that it helped. And and I never wanted it to be you know like participation award. Son, I'm so proud of you for waking up this morning. Not right. that, but honest, sincere, age appropriate when they're little and they do something great, you know, like your son right now, he's, he's young, he's five and he does something great. And you're thinking, this is good. This needs to be commended. This was a good thing that he did. And at, at this young age, it's important that he knows I see it. Mm -hmm. God, the father is the same with us. And we want that from God, the father. So I think the first thing is you got to let your kids know you appreciate them. you love them but that you're going to raise the bar for them because you want them to be the best version, the best them that God wants them to be in this world. What if, what if you're a guy who is quiet and doesn't like to talk very much and thinks that's too uh, sappy? Yeah. Suck it up because you you got a job to do. I, I've heard men say that. I've heard people come up and defend their fathers. God bless them for defending them. Oh, my dad is a quiet guy. You know, he kept his faith to himself. You know, he never told me he loved him, me that much, but I, I knew he did because ABC. Oh, that's great. Okay. I don't, I don't buy that. Like I'm an introvert. All right. It would be easy for me you know, I've always told you, you know, if, if, if God takes your mother first and I'm left alone, just put me in a room. I can watch Packer football, make sure I got ice cream and I'll be fine alone. You know, I'll come out once in a while and hang out with my kids and grandkids, but I'm an introvert. So we have to come out of that shell. You have to, if God entrusts to you the lives and souls of other people, you have a responsibility. So suck it up, cupcake, get it, cupcake, Suck it up. You got to get in there and you got to get the job done. You got to come out of your shell. And it's a muscle. You know, nobody's going to come out and, and automatically just be verbose. It's um, my mom. My mom did this. The greatest gift I think she ever gave our family is I made this paper mache like fish. I don't know. It was like it was just like crayon fish thing. It was, it was ginormous. She kept it for 31 years and gave it to me a couple years ago. And every time my children make the, you know, uh, a finger painting, a coloring, you would think you would think she got a million dollars. And and I, and I saw my mom doing this and my kids just like they were just feeding her like like coins into a, a, a video game where they were just giving her these over and over and over. And I was like, why are they doing it? It's like, oh, they're doing it because they they enjoy it and they enjoy it because she, she has learned to be appreciative. She's learned to be grateful. And so now anytime my kids make a 
they they make a picture, they they paint something, they color something. You know, I, I act like it's a, a a king tut, and it's like, and now I'm like, oh, this is how my mom's been doing it for nine thousand years. She's not that old. Well, you know what? I, on that point, I should say this, son. When I die, if you uh, you know, God willing, I go before you as the order should be, and you're clearing out my stuff in my office, and you go through my file cabinet, you're gonna find a file, and in that file is a whole lot of these pictures that you and your siblings um, drew and created and kind of tried to sign. It kind of looks like your name or it doesn't. I, I didn't keep them all. It, it'd be a whole file box, but I kept a lot of them because they mean that much to me. Mm. But I think you've got to let your kids know that they're treasures, they're precious, they're from God. And I still want you to know that even as old as you are now, I want that to be something that is just part of my relationship with my children. And, and that's something that a man can do, a woman can do, a wife, husband, father. You do this daily, regularly, let them know somehow, you know, that that child is a gift from God and you really appreciate that. And it's those simple little micro tests. Like whenever I come home, no matter if the TV's on, no matter if they're doing homework, it's the kids have to come and I, I got to get, I give them hugs. And so like the expectation, the smallest little thing is, hey, come over, let's, let's give me a hug. Tell me how, like, let me, t- let me give you a little kiss. And, uh, and then you can go on your way. It doesn't have to be these giant things. You don't have to write them love poets of how they're the greatest children ever. Just give them a hug. Tell them, tell them they're a good kid and be on the day. And that's the point it. here is this, this whole part of this podcast is about keeping it simple. It doesn't have to be a poem like you said. Yeah. Just say the words, I love you. I'm proud of you. You know, Tell me about your day. Just engage verbally with your, with well, your child. Turn the chair. Turn the chair, yep. Yeah, that was something I would say to my kids. I know I've told you this too, Steve. Oh, you know. it, it changed. It it changed because because I I work from home and and man that please tell 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 the world. That. Well, yeah, I mean I, I worked out of my home for many many years writing a you know Catholic ministry and all, and I'd be at my desk and it's so easy to be at your desk and your child comes in and says, "Hey, Dad, can I talk to you about something?" And yeah, what do you need? And you can just glance over and get back to work, and I never wanted to be that kind of guy. And so, I mean, if it's a simple thing like, hey, dad, there's an extra piece of chicken in the refrigerator. Can I have it? Huh? Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. But if they come in and want to talk about something serious, I would try, and I'm sure I failed at times, I would try to stop what I was doing and physically turn the chair, face them, so that my shoulders were squared up with them and I was looking at them in the eyes. That physical body language we show one another in this world, that means everything. And so I would say, turn the chair to your child, to your loved one, and let them know that you are giving them your time and your attention. Your work, you'll get back to. You can get that done. It's There are so many stories of people who are on their deathbed. And my friend Eric Jenis, classical musician, he's done a lot of incredible work, concerts. Uh, he does has a whole program called Concerts of Hope. Look him up. It's great. And Concerts of Hope, he'll do prison concerts, and he does concerts in nursing homes for the elderly as well at times, and he's done this for years. He said never has he heard anybody who's in a nursing home or close to the end of their life lie there and and say, oh, I really wished I would have closed more business deals. I really wished I would have made more money, had more vacations. Almost always the number one concern is something to do with relationships. I wish I'd have spent more time with so-and-so. I wish I'd have hung out with my kids. I wish I would have built that bridge. I wish I would have forgiven here or there that person. In other words, in the end of our life, the biggest concern we're going to have is not the stuff or the things. It's going to be the people. It's always about the people. That's always where it's most important. Think about the attention that you give your boss if your boss comes in your office. Yeah. Think about how you act or how you present yourself, how, like you said, square your shoulders, you know, stand tall, firm handshake when you're trying to close a business deal yeah. or get a job in a job interview, you know? So why wouldn't we give two times that effort to our children or our wife, the people who actually, I'm not saying these our boss and our employees and our workplace doesn't matter, but our family. I mean, we have to hold them so much higher, but so often we... You know, we keep our word at work. We don't keep our word to our family. Like, oh, yeah, later, buddy. Later, later, later. But then, oh, we're on time and over here. So I think it's a great self-evaluation. Yeah. Myself included. I'm just as guilty as the next guy. But daily to be thinking, what are my priorities? Are they in correct order? Am I being, am I being that integrated man in work and at home? 
Yeah. And I like that word. And you came up with that word. I know we've been we've been using it more here at BRC is the word integrated. And you you used it first, son. And I'm and and I'm and I'm proud of you for it. <laughs> I really am. Monumental moment right here. Yeah. <laughs> first time you heard it. No. But I am because that that's the word because you're right. I've told you for years I don't like the idea of balance because balance yeah. seems like there's some here and some there and right. we've you put a weigh little too much on this side of the scale and then yeah. it's going to so tip it and then oh yeah. put it back over here yeah. it just... no it's got to be this yeah. it's got to be integrated it's got to be woven it's got to be it's got to be like like it's it, i want it in my dna that this is how i want to care for the people around me that god entrusts to my life mm-hmm. i want it to be integrated in to graded to my whole being my whole my whole manner and people count on that from us. They count on how how reliable we are, and we're more reliable if things are integrated. Yeah, yeah. I think you saying turn in the chair can be taken, especially today since we've got these resilience killers. <laughs> resilience <laughs> these killer, it's good. But put the phone down or shut the TV off. Yeah. Do things that actually. I mean, we have our movie nights once in a while at home with the kids. We try to do just like on the weekends, Saturday. For the most part, we really try to keep screens to a, a minimum. Arguably, the most saddest thing that I ever saw was I was at a restaurant, and and uh, there was like a, a mom and dad and two kids, and uh, and and I was like, oh man, like man, maybe they're like, it must be like closing a deal or maybe texting grandma or something, and and I was like, man, that must be like super important, and I I happened to get up to go to the restroom and I, and I walk past, they were playing Bejeweled, they were. Out at dinner, their children are just kind of like sitting there, like da 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 da. And I was like, "Oh, I can, I can't be that. I okay, I gotta, I gotta refocus." I'm like, as sad as I am to that seeing this, it's like, oh, I can never let my kids see me like this. Now there have been times where the the kids, the kids say, "Uh, "Dad, are you getting on? You watching some YouTube's?" And I'm like, "Oh man, there's there's a, a a running meme in my house, and it's like, okay, hold on, I got I got to change this narrative. I got I got a micro task where it's like, look, when the kids are awake, they don't even see the the phone with me, just because it's like, those those poor kids had to sit at a dinner table, a silent dinner table, while their parents played Bejeweled. Yeah. I don't know about you, but Bejeweled is not more important than my children. Yeah." And that time goes by too quick, too. You're not going to get those moments back. No. We take them for granted. You know, I'm the one sitting at the table with grandkids now, and all my kids leave, and I'm just sitting home alone now, just wondering where they all are. (laughs) Cue the music. No, but seriously. I'm I'm here. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) And we work together regularly. I work with at least three of my kids, right? Um, You probably get tired of me calling you now. Was that? I said you probably get tired of me calling you now because, oh, (laughs) no, I don't. Business idea. Uh, No, I don't at all. But but it does go fast and it's over. I mean, all of my kids are out of the house. They've all moved out now. And you guys aren't really realistically that far away. I mean, it might feel that way, but. And, and obviously there's there's some time you still have. It's not like oh, it's gone in a flash. Some people say that. Well, no, it's not a flash. Days are long, but the years are short, they say. Oh, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, so it is a matter of having the perspective of looking at and appreciating what we have right now, putting it in proper order, putting it in proper priority, and taking the discipline steps that are necessary to really make sure that the people around us that God has given to us understand that we love them, we care about them, and we're doing our best with them there. So, so wrapping up here, what would you say to the guys who are tired? Work's really got them down. Maybe borderline depressed. They they agree with everything we're saying or most of what we're saying on this podcast, yeah. but they just don't have the mental energy. What are some tips or woman out there? This is specifically about men, but I mean, a lot of this stuff goes for the wives yeah. and women and mothers, mothers wi- well. or w- wives husbands mothers fathers yeah. can all benefit from a lot of this yeah so what would what are some things small things micro tasks that they can do right now today to just start like you said building that muscle of being a better leader well first thing that comes to my mind is take time every day five minutes ten minutes fifteen minutes just be quiet and and get in tune with God without going to the well, go, without going to the source of love himself, we're not able to love the way we're called to love. He is love itself. 
we can't love as completely or as appropriately as we're able to without going to him. So you've got to be disciplined and you've got to make time. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. If you can do more than that, that's great. You're busy. You've got kids. I understand that. I raised the five. I know what that's like. Still got to find five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes here or there to do that. Have a little shrine in your home. If you don't already, I have several places in my home. I can I can just sit and I can just take a few minutes here or there. I can sit on my patio. I've got a beautiful statue of our Blessed Mother out in the backyard. I've got in my office, I got a statue of Our Lady. Um, I've got uh, Sacred Heart of Jesus in the living room. There are different places I can go sit 5, 10, 15 minutes and have that time with God. That's number one, first and foremost. We, we're we going to get tired. I get tired a lot. I feel that exhaustion, especially after 33 years of traveling, speaking, evangelizing, and so forth. It gets hard. Disillusionment can set in. You feel worn out. You're burned out. Whether it's financial matters, health matters, family matters, we all go through them. Every single one of us does. You've got to stay in tune with God. That's the source of it right there. On a natural level, though, you've got to find time to take care of yourself. Eating better, get the diet better. The mouth is not a dumping ground for anything that tastes good. Oh, this tastes good. I'm putting it in. Oh, this tastes good. I'm putting it in. This is the way God designed the human body to be fed the mouth so that the body can be nourished. Doesn't mean you don't enjoy a treat and a dessert once in a while, but be nourished so that we can do the will of God. And that involves learning to love others to the best of our ability. And so nourish yourself well. Get rest where you can. Find things in your life that allow you to be active and exercise. That's important as well. But also find things that allow you to relax and enjoy. Maybe you're the type of guy that likes, or man or woman likes to go fishing. Maybe it's uh, just long walks. Maybe it's uh, you like croquet. <laughs> Let's do an old game, croquet. Maybe you just want to you want to <laughs> just <laughs> hit that ball across that yard, that wooden mallet. You know, find the things that help you. Gardening. You know, for me, I mean. I'll admit weightlifting and and exercise does help me, you know, mentally, emotionally, and all that, as well as physically. Find the things that replenish you in the physical as well. So the spiritual and the physical have to be addressed and taken care of to help overcome and deal with the exhaustion. I get the exhaustion. I I struggle with it too, you know? Um, But you've got to find the things that help keep those things even keel. Find a confidant you can talk to. That's a big part of it as well. If you can find somebody with a spiritual director or whether it's just a really good friend. And when I mean confidant, I don't mean a gossip partner. Okay. In fact, the book of Sirach, I remember growing up, I would tell, remind you of this one. You can have a thousand acquaintances, but out of those thousand acquaintances, one confidant, one person you can really trust, really count on as, as really a, a, an ideal friend. You asked me one time, dad, when did you, you were like 13, I think. Dad, when did you really have a best friend sometime? I said, I think it was 37. 35, 37, roughly your age, when I finally met somebody who I thought could become a best friend, someone I could really count on or rely on. So I guess what I'm getting at is you've got to take care of yourself in these areas, spiritually and naturally. Find someone to talk with to deal with the depression, the discouragement, the overwhelming nature of things. Um, The times that we're living in are heavy. We got to take that into account too. But take care of yourself mentally, spiritually, physically. That's what BRC is all about in order to help us be able to handle this stuff so we can be active in the areas that we're called to be. And most importantly, we're human beings, not human doings. Be in the presence of God. And just know that you're loved. And that takes practice too. It does. You have to learn how to be. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of times it's painful to sit alone with your thoughts. It is, yeah. In which case, it's a great, great time to start. Right, it is. So Steve, what what do you have? And that's why I heard a guy make a comparison between cows and buffaloes and the difference when when storms come cows deal with it differently than buffaloes and, and a, a cow will try to run away from the storm and a buffalo will turn into the storm and run into the storm and the difference we're all going to get tired and you have to choose are you going to be a cow or a buffalo because the cow runs away from the pain the cow complains about the tiredness and they end up spending way more time in the storm in the tiredness because they're trying to avoid it but the buffalo turns into it, digs a little deeper, works a little harder, runs into the storm, and the buffalo ends up spending less time in the storm because they embrace the challenge, they embrace the suck, and they go head into it. And it's like every single person can dig a little deeper. I don't care who you are. You have a little bit more in you. You can endure a little bit longer. You can hold on a little bit longer. 
and you can you can get through this this is not you will get through whatever the tiredness the pain you know i'm i'm, I'm leaving teaching and going into this other career and it's it's a little bit of a tr struggle i had to eat a little bit of humble pie and i can either run away from the pain or i can run into it and the quicker you turn into it the quicker the storm will end perfect wow. right on yeah be a buffalo. Yeah. Be a buffalo. Don't be a cow. <laughs> Tatanka. Is <laughs> that saying you can either quit or move forward? They both hurt. Oh. But one one gets you places, the other one just pets you, sets you back. So that's good. Where'd you hear that one? That's good. I don't remember. It was just the other, uh, my wife sent it to me. She oh, just okay. texted me a quote that she saw somewhere. I but. got quotes I gave my kids. They were growing up. In fact, for my birthday, they gave me a book with all my quotes in it. They all kind of wrote down different quotes in them. So we're going to add to it as the years go by, God willing, right? But that's a good one. I wish I'd have, wish I'd have come up with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, real quick, just want to remind you, check out that link in the description for the free Ultimate Preparedness Guide. Again, it's just a great way to get started on uh, getting yourself, your family prepared for uh, the natural and the spiritual. Follow us on the podcast. Share this. Please subscribe to this channel. Get this out to as many people as possible. Our goal is to help as many lives as possible be better prepared body, mind, and soul. Because you always find that when you have a plan of action, you'll get hope. You'll have hope in the face of any crisis out there. And that's what we want people to do. Have hope. Move forward and accomplish the things that God wants you to accomplish with the best of your ability. So God bless and strengthen you all. Thanks for being with us.